Welcome viewers and listeners to another episode of Blighty Talks Bricks. Um, my guest today is a man that I first knew back in 1988. Um, he didn't know me. <laughs> I. It would be fair to say that I watched him all around England and some parts of Europe uh, when he was running around in shorts. You're probably starting to think, wow, this man's weird, <laughs> i.e. me, but I probably am weird. But actually, I wasn't the only one. There was another, I would guess, around 38,000 people that did exactly the same, uh, certainly every other week. And I think that's because we knew we had in our midst someone that was very, very special, very, very talented. It probably doesn't uh, need me to say much more because you'll see the shirt that I'm wearing. Hmm. But what I would say is that the term legend is used far too frequently, in my view. But on this occasion, uh, particularly for Arsenal, this man is a legend. And it gives me great pride, great pleasure, and I'm chuffed to bits to be able to uh, say hello to my guest today, Mr. Lee Dixon. How are you? Uh, well, I'm tearing up, I have to say. I mean, what an intro that is. I can't live up to that. <laughs> but it's all downhill from here. Well, <laughs> before we start going downhill, let's have a look at this. Um, I think 15 years at my football club. Yeah. Um, I think 619 at appearances. Our football club. Well, y your football club now, yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. I and mean, even though let's you was a around. Manchester City boy <laughs> when you was a kid, yeah. we'll forgive you for that. Okay, I've let them go now. So good, it's all right. good man. That's nice to hear. So, our football club, yeah. 619 appearances, 28 goals. Um, I think I've probably witnessed the majority of them. Yeah. But then on top of that as well, uh, 22 caps for England. An amazing honour to be mm. capped by your country, mm. especially in a sport that you love. Yeah. But I think, what was it? I forget how many league titles you won, Lee, really? Three, four FA Cups? Four. Three, four. It was four, three FA Cups, one Cup Winners' Cup. <sighs> Glory so days. Glory days indeed, yeah. And, it, and the thing is about it is it went, came and it went like that. And I keep trying to say to the kids now when I talk to young pros and people in the game about how it comes and goes and how you've got to cherish it. And it's the same with, you know, don't get too philosoph philosophical at this early in the podcast, but it's exactly the same with life. You know, my dad passed away recently and I thought he'd yeah, be there forever. Yeah, thought he'd be there forever. And all of a sudden he's gone. And I think, well, where did all that time go? And it's the same with playing. And I say to the kids now, ju every single day, you just grab hold of it. And when you go to training, you just squeeze everything out of every single day. Not just football itself, but <coughs> the process that you go through of preparing yourself for football, but also life and getting to the end of the day and going, wow, that was... Whether it's a good day or a bad day, it's just understanding what process you've gone through and the feelings that you're going through. And I think sometimes we take everything in our lives <coughs> too quickly, too much... Um, too much emphasis on what's coming next yep. um, as opposed to just staying in the now and, and being present. That's my biggest lesson I've learned. You know, we're both similar age. So we get into that yeah, point where we're kind of yeah. looking backwards and going, you know, looking about. Is, is that, is that just, about. A, is that because of our age? Is that a sign of, I don't think anyone would call me mature. Not even you. Oh, but you don't have to be mature. <laughs> is it because we're getting we're mature, we're older? Is it because we, we are having the experiences of losing parents? Um, yeah, but we, we've, all, we've, we've gone through, you know, we get to our age, regardless of what your life's been like, y it, there'll be a, a, um, a series of events that's affected you in good ways and bad ways, and some more than others on, yeah. on both sides of the spectrum. But it's about how you feel at the time of these events going on. And what and what that does for you in a learning process moving forward, and learning from your mistakes, and learning from your positives as well. About you know, for me, it's all about grounding yourself back into the now, and that's been you know the last ten years or so. And I've been retired twenty odd years now, yeah. and that's gone like that. And I was like, wow, hang on a minute, I've been retired longer than I was a pro footballer. I mean, how scary, scary is that? Right. Well, that is scary, yeah. Because I think. My li uh, when I look when I f when the, my life flashes before my eyes, I, I see myself as a footballer. But there was all the life before football, being a kid and then getting to 16, 17 and signing pro. 
and then all this life after football, the football bit is quite small, in, and that's all I see myself as as a footballer. Yeah, so it's it's it's, and that's why sometimes that gets a bit. Oh, hang on a minute, it wasn't all just about those twenty two years as a pro. I've all, all this life before and after, and I've still got this amazing opportunity now to use all that stuff and knowledge to then you know hopefully. Um, uh, go through the rest of my journey on this planet uh, um, a nice sort of giving human being that's all I ever want I want you know when long long down the future we got a bit got a bit deep really early there didn't we <laughs> but we uh, I, I'd like to be remembered for um, way down the line as as a really nice kind person that's it Reget that any, anything else is a bonus well, we'll come on to the nice kind person later on for sure mm. but dragging you back <laughs> and so we don't get too far <laughs> forward already um i want to take you back to the 26th of may 1989 mm. uh, you don't have to be an arsenal fan or a liverpool fan i think if you're a sports fan it was one of the most most iconic sporting events yeah um truthful question did you genuinely believe you as a person let alone the team let alone george graham the manager did you believe that we were going to win by two clear goals did you believe we were going to win the game? Uh, no. Um, but that was my my feeling inside was, um, we can't do this because it's Liverpool. <coughs> and they were, as you know, a sensational team at that time and on a run. like They were knocking teams over for fun. They were chasing up behind us and we were like... Scared, Falling away. Yeah, scared bunch of kids because that's what we were. We were a bunch of kids. We had a, one or two, David O'Leary, and one or two senior players but in general we didn't know what we were doing it was like we'd never been into this territory before but the one thing that 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 I knocked that disbelief on the head and and buried it before the game was George George was so positive in in that we could do it mm -hmm. and we were good and he and he wouldn't he wouldn't allow me he stopped me from thinking anything else so I don't know what you call that I don't know what you I don't know what you I don't know what what sort of management that comes under. You you know you've got a successful business. How you convince people a bunch a team convince somebody that you can believe in something that is so far that down was the off line. the Richter scale, yeah. wasn't it? It was so far down the line, and then and yet as we go out, we're kind of going, we can, we can, we've got a chance of doing this. And in theory, when you look at the stats. Got no chance. No, not at all. I, and I honestly think, I've said this before, if, if Liverpool, if it was winner takes all, we would have lost. I'm no doubt about that because Liverpool was so, um, so good and on such a good run. If they'd have gone right, we just need to win another game, they would have beat us, I'm pretty but sure. But the fact they had the something to lose. Yeah, they had it, they had it and they could afford to lose 1 0 and still have it. Yeah. <coughs> and that done them in a little bit, and 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 that's I think that was the biggest factor <coughs> of why we we won the game is because they didn't need to win, and you could tell on the pitch. I'd never seen them so passive. It was like it's okay, you know. There was just a feeling about them, um, and I and I think their fans realised it as well. There was a it was a strange old atmosphere in Anfield that night. Well, it seemed. I mean. <laughs> Sadly, I gave my ticket up because a friend no, and I used to. I didn't a know friend, you yeah, no, a friend and I used to share a ticket. <coughs> Call yourself a supporter. Well, no, listen. The reason <laughs> I gave it up is because I thought we were going to bag the title before then, right? Because the game got moved anyway, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, two um, weeks later. So, um, but I'll be honest. Even the thought come on the day, I thought oh, I'm glad I'm not going all the way up because I thought we we're going to get humped. Yeah. So, I actually I played in a golf day. I went to a golf club, Cruise Hill. I got thrown out of Cruise Hill Golf Club at the end because the steward was a Tottenham fan and was very <laughs> unhappy that I was dancing around on the table. Right. Um, but I I've think seen you dance, so that's quite offensive. Well, I think it offended quite a lot of people, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, my shapes are not great. But what I found interesting that got forgotten, because it, it was just unbelievable, that goal we scored, which wasn't actually... F that The couple of minutes that followed after there seemed to go on forever. Yeah. But your pass... Mm. I mean, we, we, we look at you as a swashbuckling uh, fullback. That you, 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 you could put a tackle in. Mm. You, you know, you get away with it. You say being nice. You were known to be a little bit feisty at times on the pitch. Mm. Maybe. But that pass you made to, to yeah. Alan Smith, 
Well, it's it's funny because I, I did um I did a thing on I did a Q and A last night in near Chiswick where I live, and with Ian Stone, who's a big Arsenal fan, comedian, and he w- some of the um, punters were asking me a question about the pa- that pass, and I said I don't I don't tell this story very often um, because the the story is about the whole night really, yeah, um, and the and the celebrations after and all the, thi- but <coughs> there's a couple of things about that goal that happened that night that that, sh- that could have changed the whole sliding doors moment and if you sp- obviously the, the big one people talk about is John Barnes should have gone to the corner flag when he got the ball yep. and then the game's over because he just puts it on the corner flag we can't get it and he tried to cross it and he tried to John Barnes tried to score he's that but if you talk to John Aldrich who was on the pitch at the time yep. the ball goes to John Lukic and he picks the ball up and he looks up to throw it out to me and I didn't want it, absolutely, <laughs> 100%. I was like, don't throw it to me. What am I going to do with it? I'm just going to lump it up the pitch. But John Aldrich is standing in front of um, John Lukic, and he goes like this. Whereas he goes to throw it, he puts his arms to, to stop, the, to take really? a free kick, get a book in, run the clock down. That was his first thought in his head. And if you ask him now, really? he has sleepless nights over that. Really? And no, hardly anybody talks about it. Because I remember him here, he goes, I should have I should have given a free kick. And if you watch, if you slow motion it, you see his hands go like, and then he changes his mind. John throws it out to me. Which at that time, <coughs> when John throws it to you, not because it was you, I am cursing at the TV. I am thinking... Not as much as me. You lump it. <laughs> <laughs> you lump it up there. Get it up there to Smith. Yeah, I'm like, so I so I, I let the ball run across me. And, uh, and this, is the, this is the bit, this is the big sliding doors moment. Um, as the ball comes across me, I, I kind of let, I kind of have a half touch and just set myself up. And I and I look up and I see Alan, and he's the only person. I don't see anybody else. So there's nobody making a run. Uh, Michael Thomas is still kind of in midfield, so he's up there on his own. And I go right. That's the only ball I've ha- I've got. So I go right. I'll just hit it to Smudge and see what happens. So I put my head down, and this is this is all happening in the no. blink of an eye. So I put my head down. Anfield, it's it's May, obviously. Pitch is bumpy. It's the end of the season. The different pitches then? Yeah, completely different pitches. Not like this table now. They're all like riveted. And there was a massive... The ball's rolling away from me. Perfect. I look up, look down at the ball. And out the, cor- out the peripheral vision, I see this massive divot. And it's probably... To me, at the, on the night, it seemed about this big. In reality, it was probably a little bit of turf, but the ball was rolling towards this turf. And my stride pattern, I opened myself up and it was like one, two, three, kick to Alan. That's where the ball was. But as I see the ball rolling towards this divot, I'm thinking, I'm one, two, three, kick. It's going to hit the divot and it's going to shank it straight in the stand. <laughs> There's your moment. Straight in the so as I look down, I go one, two, and my next couple of little strides, I change my try start try uh, stride stride pattern ju- in order to get there before it hits the divot. So it's about that far short of the divot. If it hits a divot, it no way goes to Alan because I it just lifts off the floor and you hit it off your ankle and it goes wherever. So that moment changed the course of that game. I'm pr- I'm ninety nine percent sure. Really? That that he was would have hit the divot. So I get there and I go. So I, as I as I kick it, um, my re- <coughs> my relief is not that it's gone to Alan. It's just it's in that play. he didn't hit the bloody divot. <laughs> and I was like, thank God for that. And then th- obviously the rest, the rest, rest is, is history. history. So the divot is um, the match winner that night. Well, it was um, listen it, it, the most amazing. I mean, I've been lucky being an Arsenal fan um, <coughs> for many many years, and it was just one amazing night. So why? after your career comes, why did you have this? Because I think it was your idea, or somebody came to you with the idea of making the film about it, 89. Yeah, it was, <coughs> it was a collaboration. Uh, Amy Lawrence, journalist, a friend of mine, um, Davy Stewart, who directed it, um, they kind of were milling around. I think it might have been Amy that said, do you know what, this, you know, the reality has happened um, the book's been written, Fever Pitch. Fever Pitch, Colin Firth played in that, yeah, didn't he? Fever Pitch um, was been written. Uh, the, the film of, from the book has been written. So we've got a book, the reality, and a film. Nobody's made a documentary. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. And Amy sort of 
let's let's do it. And I was like, what am I going to do? She went, well, let's face it, we're going to struggle to do okay. it without you picking the phone up to the lads and I'm going. Speaking all of the players. Any chance of you, you know? So I was executive producer, which basically means calling that I was the telephone man to, <laughs> to ring everybody up. Was everyone good taking the course? Mostly. Um, <clears throat> most of the lads that I rang up um, said, oh, yeah, well, you know, typical. Th- when an idea comes in from someone, he goes, oh, I've got this idea back to you. And they go, oh, yeah, seems like a good idea. And then and they basically go, how much? Yeah. Like when you asked me to do this. How much? <laughs> well, you did ask me. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed. <laughs> um, and then it's, you know, and they're, and they're kind of half joking, but not really. They, you know, if they <laughs> saw the end thing, you know, they could... Move look forward. at the end of it and go, oh, it's amazing, I'll be involved. Of course I want to be involved. But it's a seed of somebody going, we want to make, do- how, what's the documentary look like? How much, do I, how, how long is filming? When do I have to go? Where do I have to go? Is it going to be a pain in the backside? And So it's quite difficult at times to convince someone you've got a good idea. And I was convinced it might be all right, but I wasn't totally convinced until we started doing the first interview. Similar to this studio, you kind of set a studio yeah. up and you, we've got back three, or f- three or four of the lads, and Amy did all the, the research and all the question asking, and I would just basically turn up and I'd s- sit behind the camera, and I'd be like poking my head around, and George Graham would be sitting there in this studio, and he, and then we'd ask him these, and all this stuff started coming out, and was, and I, would, I hardly missed um, a filming session because it was just to to hear because you've got your own vision of something happening, yeah. and uh, and. B- Everyone else has got a different version of that same event. You know, you listen to Nigel talking about the things that affected him. The hill when Nigel talks about Hillsborough, it really gets me every time I see him. <laughs> getting me now. Every time I see him talk about Hillsborough, I go, "Wow, that's what I wanted to say about it." But I couldn't find the words to say it. He said it in a really amazing way, yeah. and the pauses and brilliant. And then I'd listen to George talking about he thought we'd win three nil. And I'm just like, wow, he's he's madder than I thought he was, you know. <laughs> and all these little things, it was an, it was an incredible uh, experience. It was you know, probably further down the line as a, a more mature person looking at it, a, an equal um, sort of experience than actually playing in the game because I, I saw it for turned out well, didn't it? It turned out brilliant. I look, I watch it whenever I feel a bit low or something, and I, I, I put stuff like that on. I go, oh, do you know what? I'm going to watch, it, I'm gonna watch it, Fever Pitch or I'm going to watch, yeah. yeah. It's, it's an amazing watch for anyone, let alone uh, I think a big so. Arsenal fan, yeah. for sure. And and just leads me on to a question now, because um, I want to ask you about, <coughs> because you won the league with John Lukic in goal, the yeah. man that threw you the ball. Mm. Um, you're very friendly with Mr. Seaman. Yeah. What was it like when roving doors, you know, George Graham, I mean, me as an Arsenal fan, I, I thought he'd lost the plot. <coughs> We've won the league with John. Yeah. Then there's these rumours, the yeah. you know, that we're going to get the following season, David Seaman. Yeah. I was one of them. My season ticket was in the North Bank at the time, and I've had this conversation with David where I was, he said, well, when he came, I think QPR played Arsenal yeah. one or two games before the end of that season. Yeah. And as he walked up to the North Bank, I was one of the people sitting there and saying, you'll never play for Arsenal. Yeah. And he turned around and he had a raw smile on his face. He said he'd already signed he'd a already contract. <laughs> <laughs> I had this conversation with him a couple of weeks ago because I, st- I just had a, an operation on my knee and I was um, I was just coming out of hospital and, and my wife was away and and I went and stayed at Days for a week. It was brilliant. He said, I'll pick you up from the hospital and we and we, we basically, I was rehabbing my knee and I sat on his settee in his beautiful house near Reading and, um, and we basically spent a week watching sport and golf because I wasn't really getting around much wasn't fishing yeah we had a fish we yeah, had a little you did fish. it out the window evidently yeah you can just poke his, his rod out <laughs> the window it's not a euphemism it's <laughs> like and he um, and we so we spent a week just sitting chewing the fat like we used to because we used to room together he's, he's be- he became a, a really close friend of mine and we've stayed mates and it's lovely to spend time with him because he's, su- he's such a nice calm he's man calm, to be around he? think that's the thing that makes me calm being around him he's like nothing's a problem yeah. you know he very rarely gets down I'm sure he does when I'm not there or no, he when does he when you're on his settee he said and you're <laughs> clicking your fingers <laughs> can I have a cup of tea <laughs> um and he's just a, and we we chewed the fat um recently in that week and he, we were talking about that moment of him 
you know, he goes, it's brilliant because I'd signed the contract and and all the fans were giving so, me so loads. So how of was that with you? Do, do you go, well, John's my pal, and is yeah, well, to, to be honest, to be honest with you, um, when he came in, I, I I scored a penalty against him for QPR. I played against him. He still doesn't say I, I, I've scored past him. I said, yeah, I've sc- I'm sure, <laughs> from 90% sure I've scored a pen. And I've only scored 28, so we can go back in the archives and look at it. Um, and, I, and John was, I was like that as a player. I was like, why are we getting a new goalie? He's, yeah. he's really good. Yeah. You know, he's, and obviously, you know, George had a plan. Um, proved to be a good plan. It wasn't as bad. M- as wherever John was good, yeah. proved to be a good plan. But also, I think t- it's testament to John, he, you know, he came back. Yes, he came back to to the club that he loved, and and was, uh, you know, he was part of part of the the future Arsenal f- going on for a bit as a, as an understudy, and and John, but John wasn't. He was quite a, not aloof. He was quite quiet, and he was quite separated from the group. He wasn't a big drinker. He wasn't right. a big mixer. He, you know, if we went on tour somewhere, he'd sit by the pool reading his book. All the lads would be in the bar going, "What's John doing?" Because it was a slightly different culture then, wasn't there? Slightly, slightly, slightly different, different than now. <laughs> We're all—they're all reading books now. They're all reading books. <laughs> just, just—I just want to touch on quickly. What's your take on the the current situation, goalkeeping situation at Arsenal with Ramsdale? Uh, <coughs> I wasn't a fan, and I'm, I, I don't—I didn't think we needed a change. Um, I know Aaron quite well. Um, I've spoken to him a little bit about it, and obviously he's had his nose put put out of joint because yeah, he he wouldn't. didn't see it coming. No. Nope. Like none of us did. So it's a little bit similar in that respect. It's similar, yeah, lots of similarities. There's there. reasons for it that Arteta goes, you know, I want him, you know, he's not as good with his feet. I want to, I want to challenge the goalkeeper. I want that position to be, uh, which I can understand. And I think to be fair to Arteta in the long, uh, it's he's settled down now right, yeah, because of when he first came, and this is no disrespect to Brentford, but he's gone from Brentford to Arsenal. Forget about taken over from a goalkeeper that allegedly didn't need changing. He's gone from Brentford to Arsenal, which is in itself yeah. a massive jump and, and not to be underestimated how difficult that is. And, and also being a specialised position, you're not just sneaking into the midfield and no. getting away with stuff. You're, in you're, the you're right in the spotlight. And the emphasis was put on him to go, right, you're now playing and the best play, the best one will play, which wasn't the case. He was always going to play, so it, I, I felt a little bit mm, not sure about this. He's going to. I, I thought he created a problem for it, for himself. That he, didn't he didn't need, need to. to. Yeah. But ultimately, he'll be proved by the end of the season if they go like that and they win something, and he's been part of that, which he is. He's settled down to become. A, he looks really steady now, and you'd kind of people for the first yeah. time are, are, are going. And not mentioning Aaron and going, no, there's not a lot of talk about it at the moment, which is, I think, step forward. Good for it. Good for the team. Talking about winning, um, obviously, you, you you had your title. We we won again under George, and then there was that sad situation. Sad in my eyes that George left yeah. the, the club under a cloud. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your feelings when Mr. Riot come in? <laughs> Are we allowed to swear on this podcast? <laughs> no. yeah. um, surprised. Because I was like, you know, it was we, George it was the legend that is, and we'd won all this stuff, and then Bruce, Bruce Rioch, I have no disrespect to him about that, but at the time I went, isn't he Bolton, man? Was he Bolton yeah, no, manager? Well, wasn't he? It was one of them. It, was it wasn't my words. My words were, who the fuck's <laughs> that? <laughs> well, I think there was a few of those in the dressing room, but I was like, wow. I, and then there was a few rumours, I have to say at the time, about stopgap. Right. This isn't forever. And I'm not saying that anyone said anything to me be, because they didn't, but there was a few kind of... just. Be, but you, well, just he, did, be he, did, he did. He did. He was in, in manager at the time. Get us, Mr. Burkamp. Now, that guy could play no, a bit. No, he didn't, but anyway. Well, well, we assume he did. Well, he didn't, did he? No, he, he was signed by David Dean, Dennis Burkamp. You knew that. Yeah, well, everyone knew that, didn't they? Well, no, no, we didn't. No, no, you just presumed it was Bruce Rail, but he wasn't Bruce Well, if, OK, so he got us Burkamp, and Burkamp wasn't a great success when he came in terms of a goal scorer. No. Um, but, I mean, for me, when Bruce went, and then we got this bloke, I remember pulling up my house, and it came on the radio, we got this bloke, 
I had never heard of. I thought we'd signed him because his first, no, first name nearly name sounds like Arsenal. Yeah. And then when I saw a picture of him, I thought, oh, my God. I mean, following European football then, people, teams in France, mm. uh, in Japan, we didn't even know they played football in Japan back then. Yeah. Um, this guy came over and I'm sitting there, and David <coughs> Dean did get him, as we know. And then mm. we, But what was it like when you first walked in and saw the professor? <laughs> well, it was... Uh, I just had the the calmness of David Dean when he came, just going, trust me. He was one of them. And David had a, a very kind of, uh, he had a very calm way about him, but he also had a, a very authoritative kind of, you know, we all, look, I all, I looked up at him as like, he must know something, yeah. you know, because he was the way he talked, to, we always took the mickey out of him because he always used to come around and, half uh, before the game and shake everybody's hand and go and he used to say the same thing to every player you know he'd come up to David Seaman and go keep the ball out of the net <laughs> and then he'd I mean, and he'd go make sure you kick your winger or whatever it was he said to me and then he'd go to right he goes any chance of a goal today and it was like and he used to it was his, it was his routine and it was a bit of a kind of David Dean's coming in he always he always put his hand out not, not like you shake your hand like that he always used to put his hand out like that and go You'd have to, <laughs> hold, you know, it was a bit. But it was his thing. He wasn't a mason, was he? Was that? He wasn't a it, mason. I don't know. He, I don't know what he was doing, <laughs> but it was a bit of a weird handshake. And he, um, but it was a thing that he did. It was part of our home team and away. He used to come home and away and do the same thing. Yeah. It was kind of like part of you just before you go out. It wasn't just before you go out. It was. It was like an hour. You're just getting ready, and he, yeah. Mr. Dean's in. Yeah, you have a little chat, shake his hand. But he always had a th kind of. Um, an authority about him that he, he knew something that we didn't know about other stuff. He was like quite a kind of figurehead of the club at the time. And when he said, trust me, be calm, everything's going to be all right. I was like, oh, he must know something about this bloke. And he obviously, <laughs> he obviously, obviously did. did didn't he? And he brought this, you know, professor of geography in with a, all his glasses. Well, you, you're training. I mean, you, you've always liked a beer. Mm. At that time, there was. I that mean, didn't was last long. No, I was going to say. I mean, he, he must have. But that was, you know, that was that may have been, you know, in conjunction with Tony Adams as well, because he obviously stopped drinking in '96, mm. went into rehab, and in '96 when Wenger came, it was like the overlap of him coming, and he said, "Well, I want to stop the the alcohol in the in the players' lounge." Didn't tell any of the players. He just went to the manager and said, well, "I'm going to stop the alcohol." I, right. So know, Tony created that one, did he? Yeah. Right? And we went into the players' lounge after the because you could not get in the Arsenal players' lounge. The tickets were like gold dust. You got four each on a match day, and it was like the black market. It was like I need two for I need two for Saturday. I've got my auntie coming over. I've yeah. got my brother. I've got so it was like give us two now and you can have my Luton tickets and then you can have it was honestly on the match day it was all about the players lounge tickets so when these tickets and then all of a sudden Tony put tea and coffee only you couldn't get, you couldn't but you couldn't pay someone to go in <laughs> no, it was just, to go. you go in the players lounge like, <laughs> like tumbleweed coming across the it was just that changed overnight and we're like, Tone, what you do? He goes, no, I don't think it's a good environment. I said, well, it might not be for you. <laughs> yeah, we all fancy a pint now. I've got a couple of sponsors coming <laughs> to the game. They, they don't like tea. <laughs> so, um, but it was part of the culture and it was part of it. And, and George, um, uh, Arsene had this way about him that he, he would say, right, this is what you, that I'm providing for you to eat, to for nutrition, for vitamins, for all the things that would get you. That was his... His strong point was preparing you, a player, to to give your best performance on a Saturday. It was all about prep, you know. From a, for me, coaching wise, George was a coach. Arsene, right, okay. Arsene was a was a manager of men. He wasn't a he wasn't a great coach, as in not a coach that moved you around the pitch and said, "This is how we're going to play." I don't like you when you do this. You as a fullback should do that because that's not what he does. He's, he wasn't a great player. Uh, not saying you have to be a great player to be a good manager, but you have to understand certain things. He couldn't tell me anything about being Defend a fullback, it, right. but he he knew that if I give him the best, because he knew my intelligence was good enough to play in an exciting, open style of football that I would learn and pass on all my knowledge to the people around me. And every if everyone does that in a team, all eleven of them, because yep. I pass on my fullback knowledge to centre half midfield so he understands what I'm doing and I'm trying to work out and I know what he's doing now he's 
I can't play midfield. I can't do what Patrick can do, but I understand why he's trying to do that. So that enables me to be in a better position. So yep. you all feed off each other. And Arsene was second to none at preparing a team of men to do that. And he was brilliant at it. And and he just kind of and you just looked at him and go, wow. He never said. He never once said to me before we go out. I want you to do this, this. I want you to put Giggsy there. I want you to make him knock the ball into the channel for Dennis to do. Duh, duh. Never once. He, before we used to go out, he used to go, um, play with freedom. And you go, wow, what's that mean? And then after a while, you go, oh, I know what it means now. I've heard, I've heard some of the, the old guard say that he extended your careers. Mm. Would that be true? Absolutely, yeah. Nutrition. We, I was... I was relatively into that sort of stuff of eating we all had a similar diet but you know outside of the game the club don't know what you're doing when you go home and you're at home more than you at the club yep. so you could be doing anything and you know a lot, a lot of the times in the in the good old days we probably days were we've probably done it yeah doing absolutely other stuff and drinking too much or whatever having an indian the night bef- no, night after a game and then training the next day and whatever it was it <coughs> it was but he gave us the, di- uh, the understanding. He didn't force it on you. And that table's full of vitamins. Um, I'd like you to take them because this bloke here... So it wasn't, if you didn't take them, you're not playing? No, because this bloke here, Dr. Rougier, has said, and I trust him, that if you take that, that will put you in a better pl- place than you are right now. We're not taking it. All oh, right. So we used to, we, they'd be all on the table and we'd walk down in the morning and we'd have one of each tablets and we'd go, right, vitamin C, da, da, da. Half the stuff you don't know what you're taking, you just trust the manager that you're not giving you something <laughs> performance enhancing. <laughs> and you'd take it and then, but we'd, or we'd, we'd basically walk along, Dennis would get in, we'd get, push him at the front of the queue and then we'd walk behind Dennis and then Dennis was such a good figurehead for us. Yeah. We'd, we'd take whatever tablets he took. Right. So one day you get to creatine bit and he goes, I'm not taking that. And we all went to Gary Lewin, if it, we're not taking creatine. <laughs> and he's like, why not? I said, Dennis isn't taking it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's well, the world's say, best player, so well, we're just going to do what he does. Amazing footballer. Yeah. Unbelievable. It was, wasn't he? So, you had success under Arsene, you'd had success, and you, you, you've got an amazing football career, 15 years. When you came to your end of your mm. career, was you happy? I mean, I've, 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 <coughs> I, I would imagine some people go, do you know what? Injuries are making and this. Yeah. Was you happy? Was it? E- was yeah, it easy? I was. I was. Do- I was. I was ready. Um, I had a really bad knee, which I've. Really well, you just I've got two bad ones I've now. Got, by the I had two bit. good ones now. Let's look at it <laughs> oh, that way. Let's yeah. do the positive. Okay, positive. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I had my knee done after 15, 20 years of playing, but at the end of my playing career, I was really struggling with my right knee and my right ankle, and it was the games were fine because you just adrenaline pumped up with adrenaline you can do anything as soon as the final whistle went it's like oh god it's Saturday night I've got Sunday off but I'm going to be in an ice bath all day and then I've got a train Monday and we've got a game on Wednesday and I kind of started going and luckily Lauren had come in and taken over from me that last season but I still played 14 games or something that season and I was still kind of part of the squad it was the training that used to really really hurt so after my last game there was like a (coughs) It's like having, it's similar to having, a, and I've got my first grandchild, similar to having a grandchild as opposed to having kids. Yeah. When you've got kids, you've got all the love, and the, but the responsibility of having a young kid or a growing family, I always found it was like some of the weights were on my shoulders. It was like, I've got to carry this weight because these are my responsibility. And then I had a grand, grandson, 18 months old, George, named after George Graham. Is it really? Okay. My daughter named me after George Graham, George... Uh, Armstrong and Charlie George, <laughs> so he's called yeah. George, which is great. But the res- the love and, and the joy I get from him is like all of the stuff you get with your kids. But there isn't anybody sitting on your shoulders. I can relate to that. You've got a granddaughter. Yeah, yeah, I've got a granddaughter. You? I can relate and to you, everything like, you just said. It's all the good stuff, and that, that was what I felt like when I retired. It was like I've, oh, I've got all those memories, and somebody's just lifted a massive weight off my back because the responsibility playing for a club like Arsenal and I'd done it for years so I know what it's like and I've and I've mastered it but the relief of not having to hit a performance level that is almost unattainable 
was such a relief. It was just go, oh, do you know what? Until Monday morning, after the Sunday, the last game was on the Sunday, and the Monday morning came, and I thought, oh, wake up, no, I haven't got that. I woke up, and I was like, what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, so was, 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 there, was there a, I get the training, I get the pain, <clears> I can understand that, but you've been knocking around with a group of guys that are, are like your brothers. Yeah. And you're now not going to get that. Yeah, that that was. I mean, you get a bit. You get a bit of time when you go. Oh, it's great. You know, I'm not because also you're in the summer then, because you it's yeah. it's the first so day back away. at training, July the second or third, and I'm on holiday somewhere, and I'm like, God, I'll have to the boys go are back in now. Right. And that first day back in training is like first day back at school. There's a kind of nervous, twitchy energy about. Oh, I see all my mates again, but. It's We've got all that work to do again. Because George would win the league, go on holiday, come back first day, and he'd go, you lot, look at your faces. You're all smiling too much. Get rid of those smiles. Start work today. And we're like, can't we just enjoy it a bit? Look, no, right. that's it. Dump, next one. And that's how I was educated and brought up. And and I and the, and it ties into this over-celebrating thing that's going on, uh, yeah. the, 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 the accusations of it. And I, I, get, I get it. There's got to be a balance between the two. You can enjoy your wins, but you do have to rein yourself in a little bit. Otherwise, it becomes... Otherwise, when you go in training two days after a big win, like at the weekend, West Ham, the big win, and you can just get a little bit carried away. I'm not saying they are, but they're on the edge. Yeah. And I, then what happens then is you go in training on Monday and it might not quite be bang at it. And you go... And then... The next training session on a Tuesday, you kind of right, get, get focused. We've got game Saturday, but you're a day behind because you were. It yeah. would have been a Monday. Now all of a sudden Tuesday, you're getting focused, and then that creeps into a group. But there's a tie that you can do all that. You can do a high five with the kids on the side, and then passionate after Klopp running on the pitch. He wasn't that long ago. He was doing that. No, he was. You know, Arteta, and it was a, a, a it's a brilliant feeling to have. But you've got to be able to then go right, rein it in. Get back to Done. basics. Get back in the dressing room. All have your high fives. Go out for your, with your friends for dinner that night and whatever. But I'm already then Saturday night. You, sh I, you should be already then just going right. Just rein it in a little get bit, and then the you get one. ready for the next one. That's the only way I believe that you have sustained um, success doing anything. Because if you let the the successes get the better of you, sooner or later you get found out. Why Why did you not go into management? Because the way you talk, you're, you're very, you're, you're great, you're, for me, you're a great football pundit, you've got a great technical knowledge, you've got, you've had amazing managers. Um, why did you not go into wow, football management? <coughs> this is the first time that, I've been asked that question loads of times, but this is probably the first time, I'll give you an exclusive. Um, we like them. That I'm, that I'm, I'll be honest, and I've always said, oh, because I just fell into TV, and you know, and I did, and I love working in the media. It's, it's kind of suits me. It's, it's, but the, the honest, real reason is that I didn't have enough confidence in myself to do my badges when I was playing. Really? I was like, oh, I could do, I should do my badges really, and I was like, and I heard players going through the process of what they have to do, and I was like. Well, I'm, I'm going to be found out. I'm gonna, they're going to find people are going to find out whoever those people are are going to find out that I don't. I'm a I'm a bit of a chancer, and I've got there. Really? Yeah, honestly, I didn't have enough confidence to go. Not when you looked at all your silverware and and looked at no. what you did in. I mean, well, you listen, took responsibility listen, in games. Listen, Tony Adams, and I've s told this story before, but Tony Adams said to me the the, the day we retire or the couple of games before the end of the season, I covered for him on a pitch. Someone knocked the ball over the top. I ran back, swept up. Shouldn't have been there, but I knew he was in trouble. Went back, helped him out, knocked him back to keeper, ran up the pitch. And as I ran up the pitch, <coughs> excuse me, he said, <coughs> Dicko, he goes, you're one hell of a fullback. Do you know that? And I went, I looked at him well, and I went, was. I looked at him and I went, oh my God, he shivers go down the, my spine now. Because I went, you know what? I, I am quite good. And that was the day we retired. And it was purely and simply from that, so you just didn't have the confidence yet. You're going to put yourself in front of TV, which I you do now. Listen, it doesn't know. make any sense. 
doesn't make any sense. And p- people, I look at players now who've done their badges, and I go, God, I, w- I wish I'd. Have d-. And I'm not saying that I would have gone into management or coaching, but the real reason why I've not gone down. If I had my badges now, and I've had them since I retired, I might have dipped in and had a go because I, I love the game. I, I, I'm obsessed with the game, and I love it. But I didn't do the hard bit of going. This is this is me. This is. Lee Dixon at a, 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 an FA coaching A license and tr- trod the boards to get to do the hard work. And, and I was built on the hard work. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. The, when I look back at it, I go, who's that person that you're talking about? And that's me. That's the little boy. Didn't quite have. And, I, and the easy way out, the easy way I found was to go, I'll do a bit of TV and you know, stay out of trouble. You know, And I loved TV. So I went, actually, I really love doing that. And I can do that. And I'm confident of that. And I feel at home doing that. So I'll just do this. But deep down, there's a little like bit of dark space down there that goes, you, you dipped out there. You could have had a go at that. Well, you, you made a good choice, uh, even, if you didn't, even if you didn't have the confidence to do go for management. Mm. Um, because your punditry, I love it. I'm, I'm obviously biased, but I love <laughs> it. Um, NBC now, is that? Yeah, NBC and ITV. Um, NBC in America got the opportunity to do their Premier League coverage 11 years ago now when they took over from Fox and have done an amazing job with the game over in the States but it means I'm I'm here doing the comms so I get the best of both worlds I broadcast to America but I'm doing the commentary at the games here which is what I love doing I love being at games and the fact that I get an hour and it's so much better than being in a studio now because in a studio you get two minutes advert Da, da, da. you've hardly get any time to talk commentary yep. you're talking for 90 minutes if yep. you want and you you get a chance to i get a chance to give something back about what my opinion on something that I see. What happens. just insight if you can give a you know give a tiny little bit of something nobody at home could possibly know that's broadcasting in a nutshell or punditry in a nutshell give them something they couldn't possibly know from your experience and that's all i try to do you know, well, it's, else is a, it's is just a, bonus. a couple of things I just want to touch on quickly because I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, I'm 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 sitting here in awe. No. Um, time is you flying need to get by. Out more. Time, well, yeah, <laughs> time is flying by. Um, they call it soccer. I'm still calling it football. Yeah. Is the game growing in the states? Oh, mate, it's going nuts, and it will come culminate like it. You know, the the big World Cup of whatever year it was when it was in the States, can't remember. But obviously they've got the World Cup coming up in a few years' time. That is going to be off the charts. Their their Premier League um, audiences are going through the roof. Every single big team and some of the smaller teams in, in, in the UK are all going to America pre-season training. Yep. They're all trying to expand their their audience to, to the American public. Um, and NBC figures are going up and up every year but the actual interest <coughs> I did the Arsenal I went to the Arsenal <coughs> excuse me Man United game in the in the summer pre-season and I went a few years ago when they played and then the biggest difference was I can't remember how many five or six years ago there, there was you know quite a few shirts but not this time there was 80,000 people there Everyone every a single shirt. one had a shirt on either Arsenal or Man United and the, the the level of kind of uh, buy-in to, to each club over there is just crazy. It's, it's, go, it's going, it's going to, and the World Cup is going to absolutely blow it apart. I really think that. Talking about buying, one of the things I like to talk about on Blighty Talks Bricks is charities. Mm-hmm. I know, um, you know, just so people know, I actually got very lucky to meet Lee uh, back in 2014. Um, and and I feel very honoured to call you my friend, mm-hmm. even though you probably don't call me your friend. I've got another name for you. But <laughs> <laughs> Leave that one out of it, <laughs> for the time being anyway. But one of the things we touch on is charity. I know you do a lot of charity work. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you give a lot of time up. Uh, I've been on the receiving end of seeing you do that. But you have one special charity of which I, I know a lot about. Yeah. Do you just want to just talk about YDP? Well, I, th- I think we, we all try and, and let me just say to everybody out there how much you do for charity and how much how generous you are and so it's not all one-sided um you do a a massive amount and we're very appreciative at ydp your dance projects is my wife's dance company but they've got a charitable side to them (coughs) that 
do some amazing work in underprivileged schools uh, with kids, with movement classes, and just trying to um, open up people's There's a big emphasis on mental health um, going on around, and quite rightly so, at this moment in time. And part of all of that is we need to we need to get to these kids at an early age and give them something a little bit more expansive and something to, to open their hearts up and their minds up to to the possibilities of, of, of all, all sorts of things in life. And I think Yolanda, that side of things with the workshops you do is, um, there's n- uh, and as you know, in this time, it's very, very difficult to raise money now. Everyone's struggling and, and, it, and it's a tough old world out there. So the charities that themselves are, are really struggling. So anything that we can do and include both of us in, in, in sharing our experiences and sharing our contacts and our little black books and things that we can help yep. in all sorts of charities is, is something that, you know, it's just giving a little bit back. It's not, you know, I'm not doing charity work every day. I mean, it's not something that's completely consumed my life. But I, if I can give something and share something and create something through what I used to do, connected to Arsenal Football Club, and create something that monetary wise I can then pass on to 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 anybody then that's got to be a plus and it's good fun as well we have fun playing we golf fun, we race we a do. few quid for YDP we see and I see the the other side of it with the kids and go to some of these workshops and see these kids who would won't even speak to their teachers and then they do a movement class with Yolanda's teachers and they they express express how they're feeling through they might be yeah. getting troubled with bullying all of a sudden, by the end of the class, they're talking to each other and explaining to other kids why they feel that they're not being nice to them. And little things like that, man. it all comes about movement, dancing. As you said, you know, I know you're the worst dancer I've ever seen in my life. Well, thanks. But you, I didn't you think enjoy I was it. that bad. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you enjoy it. And movement's a great way in sport and dance, in, in all sorts of um, walks of life, to actually express yourself and... Uh, so yeah, we tried to put a bit back, and we're doing what we can. Well, it, well, it is a it's a great charity. I'm very honoured to be a part of it, uh, and and we'll always do what we can do. Um, you started off about yourself, just mentioning about being nice. Well, I can tell you <laughs> that you Don't are embarrass me now. one of the nicest blokes that I know, and mm. I'm gifted. I know lots of lovely people. The one thing that we have on this show is amazing human beings. Mm. Um, and you are an amazing human being. You was an amazing footballer. I've been very proud to follow you around England and Europe. Um, you're a great friend. You do a lot for the world. The world's a better place by having Lee Dixon in it. I'll tell you that. Oh, that's very nice of you to say. And so. um, I could sit here and talk to you all day. We probably will, me. won't we? <laughs> we probably will, yeah. <laughs> but no, I hope your knee gets better soon. Yeah, I'm on I the look road. forward to seeing you on the golf course soon. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your busy guy and I appreciate you've hobbled here <laughs> on the other side of London. I'm going to hobble home now. And you're going to hobble home. But um, thank you very Thanks much for your thank time. Thank you it's for been having me. Um, people, uh, another episode comes to the end of Blighty Talks Bricks. This one for me has been a truly amazing experience. I've hoped you enjoyed the chat we've had. Uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, stay safe. Thanks very much. Cheers, Lee. Cheers, bud.